Well, good morning. This is Barry O'Dell with the Church of Christ at Mammoth Spring Facebook page, and it is Wednesday morning, September 14th, 2022. Hope everybody's doing well today. We are in 1 John, and we are ready for 1 John chapter 3. Today, we've got several already on the stream. Brian, good morning. Lyle, good morning. Diana, Anna. Well, I forgot to mute. All right. Anna, Annette, William, Gail, good to see all of you guys on here today. As always, if you have any questions or comments, use the comment section here and I will address them when I see them. We're cross-posted onto the Near Churches page. You can do the same thing over there while we're live here. And even after we're live, the comment section stays open. Good morning, Lottie. Good to see you. First John chapter 3 is an encouraging chapter to the Christian. And if you remember, yesterday as we were winding down. I told you 1 John chapter 2 and the last two verses there, verses 28 and 29, kind of serve as a table of contents, you might say, to what we're going to read in chapter 3. So look at, if you follow along in your Bible, 1 John 2 verses 28 and 29 say, And now, little children, abide in him, that when he appears, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. Hey, Sheila, good to see you. So chapter 3 is going to lay that out extensively. All of the, the, well, the whole chapter, how many verses are in chapter 3? 24 verses lays out precisely what John says there in verses, in chapter 2, verses 28 and 29. So I don't know how far we're going to get today. We'll see how it goes. But like I said, questions or comments, add them into the uh, comment section here, and uh, I will address them when I see them. My insulin pump was giving me an alarm. All right, everything's good. 1 John 3, verse 1. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us. And notice the language here. He has bestowed on us. This he, John's writing to Christians. This has been done. All right, so this is a present reality. that we should be called the children of God. One of the images that is portrayed here in 1 John 3 and part of the and a lot of the rest of the book is this concept of family. You know, if you've been baptized into Christ, you are a child of God and therefore we are brothers and sisters in Christ, okay? You're all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ and there's neither Jew nor Greek there's neither bond nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. That's Galatians 3, 26 through 29. One of the aspects we cannot forget about the church, not, not only not forget about it, but that we should never fail to appreciate is the familial aspect. This is a family. Hey, Miss Janie, good to see you. The church is a family. And I've seen it, you know, in... 25 plus years of preaching, I've seen I've seen people treat it as an optional matter, the church, as an optional matter. I've seen them treat it, I've seen some people treat it kind of like a I'm gonna I'm gonna go to church to have business connections in the community. Um I've seen people treat the church as a matter of competition. Preachers, I've seen preachers like have a competitive attitude towards one another. Um, and I've seen that with elders and preachers. It's like an, at a local congregation, an elder or an eldership and the preacher, they're in competition to see who the congregation likes more. And if, if that's our approach to Christianity, then we're, man, we're way off base. This is a family. And it, it is often the case, sadly, that we will treat, that Christians will treat their physical family who may not be Christians better than their spiritual family who is Christian. And that's that's just not good. We are the children of God. Okay? And that and notice how he says that in verse one. What manner of love, what you know, this this is such a privilege. It's a, it's like a matter of emphasis here. What manner of love, what level of love that we can be called the children of God, and so we're related to one another, and we shouldn't forget that. Therefore, hey, good morning, Miss Connie. Good to see you. First John chapter 3 and verse 1 is where we are. Therefore, the world does not know us because the world did not know him. 
and this is this is not just the idea of a acknowledgement that somebody exists or that God exists. This is much deeper than that. Jesus, in, in talking to his apostles in John chapters 14, 15, and 16, and particularly at the end of chapter 15, he talks about um, the the idea of the, the world, you know, don't be surprised if the world hates you. You know, you can, rest assured, basically, Jesus says, if the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. Well, the world doesn't know us. It, it doesn't comprehend. It doesn't fully grasp what it means to be a Christian because a lot of the world didn't know him. They didn't grasp him. You know, John in the Gospel of John in chapter 1 says, He came to his own and his own received him not. The light shined in darkness and the darkness didn't comprehend it. And that's kind of the idea here. Um, but we should have that understanding. Okay, we are a family. We are the children of God. Therefore, we are brothers and sisters with, with one another. I'm looking at the text on my screen over here. But the world doesn't grasp that with us because it doesn't grasp that with Him, with God Himself. Well, we shouldn't fail to understand it. Sheila says, I heard a brother say being a deacon looked great on his resumes. Well, all right. <laughs> there is that approach, isn't there? There is that view that people have in regard to the church that it's that it's like some kind of business connection in the community. People have that aspect. T uh, take that aspect. Verse 2. Beloved, now we are children of God. Again, a present reality. It's not something off in the future, not a, not a hopeful, not a wishful thinking kind of thing. We are the children of God. And it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. Okay, so here's what we are currently, but there's something in the future that we don't know about yet. Notice that. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Now, that goes back up into chapter 2, remember, uh, verse 28. We have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. Okay, so that coming now is referenced again here in chapter 3 and verse 2. We are currently the children of God, present reality, but there's something in the future for the Christian that we don't... And this, think about this, okay? This is an inspired apostle. This is the disciple whom Jesus loved. All right? This, this, is the, this is one of the disciples that we refer to sometimes as the inner circle, one of the closest of the twelve to Jesus. And he says there, there's something in the future that we currently as Christians, as children of God, that we, we, that we don't know. Well, this can only be a reference to the resurrected body. Because listen again to the language of verse 2. It has not been revealed what we shall be. Okay, it has been revealed what we are. We're Christians. We're living in this world. We're to conduct ourselves in a certain way. But we know, here's what we do know about it. When He is revealed, well, that's talking about Jesus, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. We're talking about the resurrection, we're talking about the resurrected body of Jesus, and there was a change. You read those post-resurrection accounts in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, particularly Luke and John's, Luke's and John's accounts, and uh, it, it's, it's an interesting read. Take notes on what you find there. But just a, a couple of passages here, and I guess I can pull it up on the screen so we can all see it together uh, in, in regard to the, to the resurrection of Christ. I'm going to run over real quick to Acts chapter 1 and look at verse 3 here, talking about Jesus after his resurrection uh, with the apostles, to whom he presented himself alive after his suffering <clears throat> by many infallible proofs. Okay, they knew, and it was unmistakable that this was Jesus, being seen by them 40 days and speaking of the things concerning the kingdom of God. So that, again, post-resurrection, the period of time between his death, burial, and resurrection his ascension, and then, of course, the um, establishment of the church as recorded there in Acts chapter 2. So that's one passage that we have on this. He, he appeared alive, presented himself alive by many infallible proofs. You could not mistake that this was Jesus. You know, one that I think of is in, well, I tell you what, I'll just go ahead and pull it up since I'm here in the neighborhood. John chapter 20 um, 
let's see here. Uh, it starts really in verse 19. The disciples were gathered together. And, of course, you have the Great Commission. Uh, Judas, Judas, Thomas, rather, slip up on my part there. Thomas, called the twin, Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. And so he spoke to them, and then they say, well, listen, we've seen Jesus. And you remember what, Ty, uh, what Thomas said there, unless I see the print of the nails in his hands and put my finger into the print of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. And a lot of times we call him, because of what he said there, doubting Thomas. And I don't think that's right. It doesn't say that Thomas doubted he appeared to them. He wants the evidence. And you, so you notice, okay, eight days later, John 20 and verse 26, now Thomas is with them. And notice, that, notice what happens here. We're, we're talking about this change that happens in the resurrection. Remember, John says, okay, we are currently children of God, but there's something different in the future. We don't know what it's going to be like, but we do know that it'll be like him because we'll see him as he is. So after eight days, John 20, 26, his disciples were again inside and Thomas with them. Jesus came, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst. How, how did he do that? I don't know. He, he had a physical body. What is it, Luke 24, 36? It, it's me. He said, a spirit doesn't have flesh and bone like you see I have. And yet the disciples could be in a room with the doors shut, and then Jesus manifests. He's there. Um. <laughs> Deborah says, could you say he tried the spirits? I'm assuming you're <laughs> talking in reference to Thomas and his re his request to um, basically, look, I'm not believing until I see it. So, yeah, I think technically you could say that. I hadn't really ever thought about it that way. But you look here in John chapter 20 and verse 26, and this text following, well, Jesus didn't show up and say, Thomas, I cannot believe you didn't just accept what they said. Notice what Jesus does say to him. Peace be to you. Then he said to Thomas, Reach your fingers here and look at my hands and reach your hand here and put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. Here's the evidence. You don't have to, you don't have to just take them at their word. Here you go. And one of the interesting things is that we're never told what Thomas's response was other than this my Lord and my God. Here's the evidence. Touch it. We don't have any indication from Scripture that he did. Here's the evidence, and Thomas's response is, my Lord and my God. And then notice Jesus. Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Well, that would be me and you today. So anyway, let me get back to our text here in... 1 John chapter 3. So, we are currently, verse 2, the children of God, we, but there's something future we don't, don't yet know. So think about the resurrected body, okay? Um, one of the passages I think of, I don't know why I do that. I'm, I'm still not used to having this text up here on the screen. One of the passages I think of is Philippians chapter 3 and the last two verses of that chapter. Look at what Paul writes here. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which also we eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Look, who will transform our lowly body, that it may be conformed to his glorious body. That's what John's saying in 1 John chapter 3. Here's what we are currently, but there's something yet we don't know what it's going to be like, but it will be like his. And that's precisely what Paul said to the Philippians. He's going to transform this lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious body. Well, that glorious body was post-resurrection, ascension, and seated at the right hand of the Father. I think that's one of the reasons we're told that the mediator between God and man is the man, Christ Jesus, 1 Timothy 2.5. Jesus didn't become a spirit and float off into the clouds like we, like we imagine sometimes of heaven. Like, I'm a big Three Stooges fan, okay? And there are some episodes where at the end of the episode, they blow themselves up or something like this, and they float off in the clouds with wings and harps. You know, th there is a lot of misinformation, misunderstanding out there about the post-Earth existence. 
we we are physically raised physical resurrection John 5 verses 28 and 29 bodily resurrection but when he comes because we're eagerly waiting for him Philippians 3:20 he's going to transform this lowly body that's going to be raised and it's going to be conformed like unto his glorious body and we just don't know what that's going to be like and the fact that John the apostle said I don't know what that's going to be like. That should go a long way with us. If he didn't know, and he walked with Jesus, and he was inspired by the Holy Spirit, if he himself did not know, then don't ask me, because <laughs> I know a lot less than he. All right, so another passage, I, I flipped over to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, beginning in verse 35. So this entire chapter... Um, David says, if we would have seen a Roman crucifixion, we would have doubts ourselves. Sometimes we are too hard on these folks back then. Yeah, yeah, that was, the Romans kind of perfected, if that's the, if that's the right way to put it, crucifixion. It was a form of, it, I mean, it was capital punishment, but it was, a, you couldn't get any more torturous than, than, than crucifixion. So, something to think about. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, talking about this resurrected body. The entire chapter is based on the fact that there were some in Corinth, they didn't doubt the resurrection of Jesus. They were doubting a future bodily resurrection. And Paul says, well, let me just scroll up here real quick. 1 Corinthians 15, 12. Now, if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, okay, he has. And, and that goes back to verses 3 and 4. This is the gospel that I preached to you, that, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that He was buried, and that He rose again according to the Scriptures. Now, if Christ is preached that He has been raised from the dead, look at this, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? The only thing He can be talking about here is a bodily resurrection because it's based on Christ's bodily resurrection. You have believed, and, and remember what he said there in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 and 2. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, wherein ye stand, and by which also you are saved, if you keep in memory the things that I have preached unto you. And it was about the death, burial, and the bodily resurrection of Christ. So if Christ has been preached that he was raised from the dead, and he was, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? And then he goes through the... here. Okay, so if that's what you're going to say, that there is no future bodily resurrection, here are the implications. Then Christ is not risen from the dead. He's still in the tomb. Well, how can you say that? Because you go down to verse 20, Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Jesus was raised from the dead. His bodily resurrection guarantees our bodily resurrection. But here's what we're talking about in, in the context of 1 John 3 and verse 2, where, remember, John said, we, we don't know what it's going to be like, but it'll be like his. So you start reading in 1 Corinthians 15, 35, two questions. Question number one, how are the dead raised up? Well, God's going to take care of that. And Philippians 3, the end of verse 21, talks about that. It, it's it's the, the same power that raised up Jesus from the dead. God will take care of that. That's question number one. Question number two in 1 Corinthians 15, 35 was, and with what body do they come? There are some today who say that um, this entire chapter, 1 Corinthians 15, that's a spiritual resurrection. There, there are those even within churches of Christ who deny a future bodily resurrection. You know, the, the AD 70 guys, preterism. I've got a series of videos of that on our YouTube channel. Um, six or seven videos, but they teach that 1 Corinthians 15 is not a bodily resurrection, which makes no contextual sense. It makes no theological sense, but they're going to hang on to that until they die. They will not let go. What With what body do they come? Paul is being asked, and he's addressing a question, how are the dead going to be raised, and with what body do they come? And this is all within the context of Jesus was raised from the dead, and since that's what we preached, how do some of you deny that there will be a resurrection from the dead? Well, and then he talks about, um, hmm, already over 20 minutes. I might go a little bit longer today. Verse 36, Foolish one, what you sow 
is not made alive unless it dies. Okay, you plant something, you plant a seed into the ground, and that thing, however it works, decomposes, dies, and produces something that is of that origin, but it looks different. It is different in that sense. You plant watermelon seeds, and what comes up out of the ground is not a watermelon seed. It's the produce of that of that thing that you put in the ground. It's the same thing, but it, it's different. We understand that. Foolish one, what you sow is not made alive unless it dies. And what you sow, you do not... And, and here he says it. And what you sow, you do not sow that body that shall be, but mere grain. In other words, when you want a, when you want a tomato plant... You don't bury a tomato plant. You bury the seeds. You plant the grain, perhaps wheat or some other grain. But God gives it a body as He pleases, and to each seed its own body. You plant tomato seeds, you're going to get tomatoes. You plant watermelon seeds, you're going to get watermelon. That doesn't, <laughs> that doesn't change. You plant human seed, you're going to get a human. Okay? Then he talks about the fact that there are different kinds of flesh, men, animals, fish, birds. They're all different types of flesh. Birds have feathers. Fish have scales. Humans, well, we've got what we have. It's all different, and we understand that. And then he also talks about that there are heavenly bodies. There, there are celestial and terrestrial bodies. Celestial, those in the sky. Terrestrial, those here on the earth. Um, and, and they're different. All of this is in the context of this statement right here. So also is the resurrection of the dead. The body is sown in corruption. Okay, this body that we have is susceptible to injury, to disease, um, and of course, ultimately death. So it's sown in corruption, but look, it is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It's sown in weakness. It is raised in power. Well, how? By God. Now, look what he says here in verse 44. And this is where people get this idea that there's not going to be a physical resurrection, that 1 Corinthians 15 is about a spiritual resurrection. Paul says, It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body, and there is a spiritual body. Okay, so the word uh, uh, natural is sukikos. According to this, this makeup, Spiritual is the Greek word pneumatikos, and it doesn't mean non-physical. Um, it, it has the idea of empowered by the Spirit. You do a study of the word spiritual. I forget the Strong's number, but uh, anyway, pneumatikos is the Greek term, and it's that which is empowered by the Spirit. That's what this resurrection is going to be like. It's not going to be something that we do of ourselves. It's going to be empowered by the Spirit. John said in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 2. So let's get back to our, let me pull up our text here and we'll kind of wind this down for today. Uh, 1 John 3. All right. It has not yet been revealed what we shall be. And that's why we were looking at 1 Corinthians 15. Here's what we do know, though. We know that when he is revealed... We will be like him, for we shall see him. Look at that. We shall see him as he is. Those guys who teach that there is no future resurrection or future judgment day, that all the resurrection passages are spiritual, they have to deal with that. There's a day coming. We don't know what we're going to be like, but we will see him, and we'll be like him. So what do we do as a result? I guess we'll do the first three verses of 1 John chapter 3 today. Let's wrap this up here. Everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. Well, what's the hope? Well, the hope is not becoming a child of God because, as he says in verse 2, the first part of verse 2, now we are children of God. That was a present reality. And so everyone who has this hope, the Greek word for hope is elpis, and it's the idea of expectation and desire. So you have this expectation to be changed, to be resurrected from the dead, and you have that desire you have that hope in you, and so you continually purify yourself just as he is pure. If we want to be like him when he returns, then we need to be like he was right now. 
we purify ourselves now so that we can be like him whenever we see him in the future. That's what 1 John chapter 3 verses 1 through 3 are talking about. And that again that goes back to 1 John chapter 2 and verse 28. When he appears, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. That's hope of the resurrection, a physical, a bodily resurrection. All who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. John 5, verses 28 and 29. All right, guys, I guess that let's stop there for today. Three verses, that's not very far, but that's okay. A couple comments here. Connie said, I saw a post that said, since Christ's, said since Christ had a different body, that Christ is no longer on level with God. I don't get that. And what is the scripture to say that? Yeah, I don't get that either. Um, he never, Christ never forfeited his divine nature. <clears throat> Remember, Connie, Colossians 2 and verse 9, in him was the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Now, one thing perhaps that he gave up was his, what we refer to as omnipresence. God is omnipresent. Well, as a human being, you're not, you can't be omnipresent. But he didn't lose his omniscience. He didn't lose his omnipotency. He, he didn't lose any of that. He was the fullness of the Godhead, but he was in a body, in bodily form. So he, can't, he, he couldn't be omnipresent. But to say that, he, that he's no longer on level with God, it, you know, it may be, and I'm just thinking out loud here, Connie, it may be something, it may be in reference to what we read in, for, for a person to come to that conclusion, what we read in Philippians chapter 2, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. Perhaps it might be that, but, but that passage doesn't even uh, imply that he is not on level with God, let's say. I, I don't know, I don't know where you'd get that, I'll just answer it that way. Oh, let's see here. Good morning, Kiza. Good to see you. Blanchard, good to see you. Annette, you're welcome. Michelle, Brian, thank you guys. Appreciate y'all being on here today. David and Billy over on the Near Churches page, good to have you. All right, guys, that's it. We'll pick up in 1 John chapter 3 tomorrow and verse 4. So thanks for being here today. If you're somewhere tonight where you don't have evening services or perhaps you're under the weather, We'll be streaming our services here at 7 Central, and we're doing an overview of the book of 2 Timothy. So you can read ahead of that. And uh, anyway, all right, guys, thanks for being here today, and hope to see you back here tomorrow at 11. Have a good day.